Okay, so Hebrews 4, if you have a Bible, Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to begin our next chapter in the book of Hebrews. And I want to remind you where we left off, just kind of the big over, uh, overview, thought flow of the book at large, and then we'll make it as far as we can through chapter 4 here this evening. But we are going to enter a new section, the first half of Hebrews chapter 4, first 13 verses. I'm putting under the subheading of Jesus being better than Joshua. Recall the suggested outline that I've, I've given you this a few times in our study, and we'll revisit it. But the first half, well, really two-thirds of the book, is argument, argumentation, where the author is arguing for the superior personhood of Christ and the superior priesthood of Christ. Christ in his person is superior, he is supreme, he is better than prophets, angels, Moses, and Joshua. And we're going to see that uh, that fourth idea, how he's better than Joshua. We'll look at that here this evening. That's uh, our passage here in chapter 4. But not only does the author argue for the, super the superior personhood of Christ, but also the superior priesthood of Christ, um, which is... Back here, sorry about the slide skip in there. But in that chapters 4 to 10, argues for the superior priesthood of Christ. He's a better high priest with a better order, better covenant, better sanctuary, and a better sacrifice. And so that's what we have ahead of us. And then, of course, again, just by way of reminder, after arguing for the supremacy of Christ in both his personhood and priesthood, then the author will go to application. After argumentation is application. If Christ is better, if he is supreme, then we ought have faith in him. Effectual faith, he describes at the end of chapter 10. Examples of faith, chapter 11. Endurance of faith, chapter 12. Evidences of faith, chapter 13. So that's where we're heading in our study, but that's where we're at right now, is we're looking at this final piece of the author's argumentation concerning the supremacy of the personhood of Christ, how he is better than prophets, angels, Moses, and Joshua. And so that's what we're going to look at here tonight. Now, here's the big connecting thoughts. If you were with us last, well, the last two weeks, it took us two weeks to get through uh, the latter half of chapter three, but we are right in the middle of the second warning passage of the book of Hebrews. Recall this, there are five warning passages to the book, and the book is essentially a sermon where it's, gonna, it's going to vacillate, go back and forth between argumentation and application or explanation of some truth and then an exhortation of how we are to live in light of that truth. Well, we're right in the middle of the second warning passage, which is a lengthy one. It goes from chapter 3, verse 7, all the way to chapter 4, verse 13. And this passage is, extent, it is essentially an exposition of Psalm 95. Recall this. It warns us not to repeat the failures of the first Exodus generation. This warning passage can basically be divided in half. We took two weeks to look at that first half. That's chapter 3, verses 7 to 19, which warns us against the curses of unbelief. Well, tonight we're going to begin our examination of the last half, the second half of this warning passage, which is really a little bit more positive, and it's going to unpack the blessings of belief. So, Obviously, it still is warning us against unbelief, but it's using, it, it's, it's using some more positive language pointing to the rest that God has promised and provided for us. And so he's urging us to go on and believe in Christ and enter that rest that has been provided for us. And so he's still harnessing the illustration of the wilderness generation, but he's giving us uh, again, the negative example, what not to do, don't be like they were in unbelief, rather be positive. Do what Joshua did, essentially. Uh, he's going to build and say more than that, but uh, we are to go in and enjoy the rest that God has prepared and promised for us. And so that's, that's really where we're at. We're in the middle of this second warning passage. So with that said, let's read our text. We may not get through all these 13 verses uh, tonight, that's okay, but we will make as far as we can. Hebrews 4, verse 1 to verse 13. Let's read this together. He says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, 
as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore, notice he's emphasizing the if there in verse five, if they shall enter into my rest, and then he's, he's going to em emphasize the if, and he's going to em emphasize the rest. Verse 6, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preach, preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is written, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, or better translated Joshua, depending on your translation, it's not talking about Jesus Christ, it's talking, remember that's the same name, Jesus and Joshua are the same name. There's, uh, in Hebrew, but given the context here, we're talking about Joshua and the conquest of Canaan. But he says, if Joshua had given them rest, then would he, that is referencing David, we'll build the argument here in just a second, but if Joshua had given them rest, then he, David, would not have afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest he hath also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the uh, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All right, now that's a mouthful. Let's see if we can work through this carefully, think through this text. It's all connected with what we've already been talking about in chapter 3, but let me see how I can walk you through it. First of all, just note the basic division of the text. Verse 1 and verse 11 of that passage that we just read neatly divide the passage into two primary parts. You see, there's two commands that are given in this, main commands given in this, in this passage. He says in verse 1, let us therefore fear falling short of rest. In other words, it is such an important thing, it is of eternal consequence that we enter into the rest that God has provided, that he says we ought fear falling short of that. All right, and I'll build that argument in just a second, but that's verses 1 to 10, essentially. It's under that heading. Let us fear falling short of rest. But then in verse 11, he gives us another command. Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. In other words, we this rest, which we'll define in just a second, what rest is he talking about? Well, this rest is so important that we ought fear falling short of it and labor to enter into it. Right? That, the whole paragraph is built around those ideas. So essentially, the primary theme of this passage is, is helping us or, or exhorting us to understand and enter God's rest. And this is, again, so important that I ought fear missing it and labor to enter into it. Those are the big ideas. Now, he's going to build his argument. You've got to follow it carefully. Not about you, but when I was first reading my Bible and, you know, whew, as a high schooler, I struggled with the first half of this chapter. The argument is tight. It is very nuanced. And you got to follow him really closely. So I'm going to do my best to break it down as simply as I can and give you the big thought flow. But feel free to ask questions. Now, here is, in my opinion, uh, here is the thought flow to this paragraph, okay? Now, is that big enough for you to see? I'm gonna get All right. So verses 1 to 10 is all about, again, he says, fear falling short of rest. In other words, don't be like that first generation who came right to the edge of the promised land but didn't go in. Therefore, they did not enjoy the rest God prepared for them. He says, don't do that. Rather, verses 11 to 13, labor to enter into that rest. Let's go and let's enjoy the rest that God has. Well, what he's going to do is he's going to build a rather fascinating argument. In the first three verses... And this is, again, I, I hope this is helpful. This is, I'm just trying to break down the thought flow. The first three verses, he's going to talk about how the rest of God, God's rest, has been promised. It was first promised to Israel, but they rejected it. In like manner, it is 
promised to us through Christ, we also have a rest of sorts that is been, has, has been promised to us. So he says, rest has been promised, verses 1 to 3. But rest has also been pictured by God in the Garden of Eden. He's going to talk about the Garden of Eden. He's going to quote that in verse 4. And he's going to talk about how God's rest, the kind of rest that God ultimately wants us to enjoy, was first pictured by him when he created all things in six days and then rested on the seventh day. So this rest is promised to us, but it's also pictured to us by God in the Garden of Eden. But this is also, this rest that God wants us to enjoy has also been proclaimed to us. It's been proclaimed by Christ. And this is where the argument gets really tight. In verses 5 to 9, he's going to explain why the rest that God promised to the wilderness generation was not fulfilled by the conquest. Now, it's, it's once you understand where he's going with it, it's pretty easy to discern. But he's going to describe how, hey, if, if Joshua gave them the rest that God promised, then why did, 400 years later, David still say that there was a rest to be had? In other words, the conquest of Canaan did not give the ultimate rest that God wants his people to enjoy. So based upon that simple observation, the author is then going to say, Though it was unfulfilled in the conquest, it can be fulfilled. It is available in Christ. That we today can enjoy the rest that God is promising. He has promised all along throughout the Old Testament. He is still promising to us today. It is a rest given to us in Christ. So he's going to, again, use the wilderness generation as an illustration for then a spiritual application to his contemporary audience. So again, just we'll, we'll walk through this as, as, as best we can. Slow me down if you got any questions. But here's the big bird's eye view of the thought flow of the chapter, all right? Now, again, if you got questions, stop me and slow me down. But as we walk through it, hopefully this outline will become apparent. So then, of course, that's probably as far as we'll make it tonight, to be honest with you, is verses 1 to 10, if we make it even that far. But then, verses 11 to 13, after he says, fear falling short of rest, he says, now labor to enter into rest. And so he says, essentially, verse 11, hey, let's go. I'm, you know, I'm going to go enter into the rest. I am going to embrace Christ. And then he says, you should too. And he gives us a motivation why we should in, labor to enter into rest, why we should cling to Christ. All right, so, are you with me so far? I say, wait, slow me down if I'm going too fast. Okay. But let's walk through this. All right. Think about this with me. Now, verses one to three, rest is promised. Notice again, let's reread this. He says in verse one, let us therefore fear, lest, a promise being left to us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. All right. So let's be aware and alert and even fearful of falling short of the rest that God has promised. Why? For, verse 2, unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Is it enough to simply hear the gospel? No, you must hear the gospel and believe the gospel. So he says, the gospel preached unto them did not profit them. Why? Because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. All right, that makes sense. So he says, verse three, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Now, <clears throat> pause there. But what is he talking about? Follow the thought flow. Rest was promised to ancient Israel in the conquest. Yet they did not believe God's promise. Therefore, they fell short of God's promise. Now, we talked about this last week, so again, re recall the context here. But in Numbers 13 and 14, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 1, we went and read Deuteronomy chapter 1 last week, if you recall. It illustrates how that first generation of Israel in the wilderness did not believe God. God promised them rest. What does that mean? Well, if you go to these passages, and for sake of time, just jot them down. But in Deuteronomy 12, verse 9... And then several times in the book of Joshua, Joshua 21, Joshua 22, Joshua 23. The conquest, entering the land, conquering the enemy, 
and setting up shop, enjoying the land that God provided, that was alluded to as rest. Because think about it. What did these people do for 40 years? They wandered around the wilderness. They lived in tents. They were never quite sure from one day to the next if they were going to stay or if they were going to go. That is the total opposite of rest. You know what I'm saying? And my mom taught me this from a very early age, and then my wife has continued to teach this to me. Women, some women, are like nesting, right? They like to nest. They like to have a place to say, yes, this is my home. I'm going to stay. You know, I'm going to sink roots. I'm going to make, I'm going to decorate. I'm going to, you know, I need a place. I need some security. I need some stability. And if we move too often, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, it's the opposite of rest. <laughs> so what did they do for 40 years? They weren't sure what they were going to do from one day to the next. But once they entered Canaan, conquered the Canaanites, they were going to rest. They were going to have a home. They were going to stretch their legs. They were going to have their own land, plant crops, grow those crops, harvest those crops, enjoy those crops. They were going to live in the land and enjoy the rest God had promised them. Does that make sense? You got a thought there, Bob? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that's right. There was an inherent tension. The women were like, just go in there and beat the enemy. And they're like, I don't know. I kind of like camping. I don't like those giants. <laughs> right? I'm reliving these moments. I see where you're going with that. Uh, exactly. Exactly. All right. But you see, that's the premise that he's building in verses 1 and 2. And he's saying, listen, rest was promised to them. But they failed to enjoy that rest. Why? Because they failed to believe God. They would not enter into the promised land, fight those Canaanites that God said they would have victory over. Therefore, they never enjoyed the land that God promised to them. They, they had rest available, but they didn't believe God. Therefore, they didn't enter into that rest. Does that make sense? So now he's, now he's making in verse 2, he's making a, a correlation. He says, well, just like they received the gospel but didn't believe it. We'll come back to that. He says, we too have received the gospel. We are being offered rest. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, again, you probably have more than one answer to this, but do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11? Go there just briefly, all right? In other words, rest is a good way to not simply describe the conquest of Canaan, but it's also a good way to describe the salvation that Christ offers. In fact, Jesus even described it this way himself. Matthew chapter 11, and let's see, verse, uh, well, really 28, I guess, for sake of time, we'll just jump into verse 28. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All right? So Christ himself described believing in him as experiencing, finding and experiencing rest. Our author here seems to be making a correlation. He says, just like rest was promised to that wilderness generation, if they would go in, conquer the land, enjoy the land, he says, isn't rest promised to us in Christ? Didn't Christ promise us rest? In fact, again, you could just, uh, just to give you another cross-reference, it doesn't use the word rest in particular, but in John 20, uh, again, it, it highlights the whole purpose of the gospel. He says in John 20, verse 30 and 31, he says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. In other words, we are in Christ promised eternal life, a rest of sorts. Not just of sorts, it's the ultimate version of rest, which we'll look at in just a second. So with that said, notice how he builds this interesting case. And, and I got to pause on this just for a second because I'm, a, I'm just slightly, just a tad fascinated by this idea. And I'm trying to, you know, keep it to only one slide. But he says in verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Now think about this. We understand the gospel is preached to us, right? What is the gospel? Well, it's kind of a loaded term that is infinitely deep and wide. But to summarize it, what did Paul say? 
So the gospel is this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? That Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again according to the scriptures. In other words, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, that Christ died for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. That is the essence of the gospel. If I understand what he did for me, if I trust in Christ as the payment for my sin, as the means by which I can have and receive eternal life, that's the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But in what way was the gospel preached unto them? Now, this can get really deep. And so I'm just trying to, you know, just kind of skim the surface here. But recognize that, first of all, all the mysteries of the gospel, like I said, that little word gospel is infinitely deep and wide. The whole Bible, essentially, is an exposition of the gospel. And all the manifold mysteries of the gospel were not fully revealed until the New Testament. In fact, we have places like 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 14, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, that talk about how there were mysteries. There were things that were true about God and about what God was going to do in and through the gospel that were unknown in the Old Testament, that were not fully known until the New Testament. However, the essential aspects of the gospel, I would suggest to you that this phrase and many other places in the Bible suggest that the essential aspects of the gospel were present in the Old Testament. Like what? What essential aspects of the gospel? Well, this is where, I, like I said, this can get really deep really fast, but let me give you a couple suggestions and you can add to the list. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But first of all, God's intention to bring blessing to the world. In Genesis 12, God said to Abraham, I will bless you and through you I will bless all the families of the earth. I'm going to bring blessing to the rest of the human race through Abraham. That is the gospel in a nutshell. In fact, Paul says that. In Galatians 3 and verse 8, he says, I got, I got to read this one to you, all right? And this is one of, I, this is a fascination of mine, is to find the gospel in the Old Testament, to find Christ in the Old Testament. And it is a marvelous, marvelous uh, you know, motive and method of study. But in Galatians 3.8, listen to what Paul says here. He says, well, 7, let's read 7 and 8. You know, therefore, that they which are of faith are the same, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached the gospel unto Abraham, saying, quote, and he quotes Genesis 12, in the shall all the nations be blessed. In other words, Paul sees the gospel in seed form in the Abrahamic covenant. The promise God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, Paul says in that little statement, Paul says, I can find the gospel to the, to the Gentiles. Salvation by grace through faith. You know, I mean, that's, that's a pretty profound concept. But the point is, in what way is the gospel present in the Old Testament? Well, at least you could say God's intention to bring blessing to the world, the necessity of faith. All right? Paul will make a big deal of that. The life of Abraham, Genesis chapter 15, he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So salvation by faith, that's present in the Old Testament. Even the concept of substitution, what's that? Well, that's why I throw Leviticus 17 there. That's the blood chapter. It talks about the sacrificial system, the blood that God said would be shed on that altar, and through that, God would bring atonement you know, to, the, to the nation of Israel. Again, atonement, at one meant. He would bring reconciliation. He would atone for their sins. So, I mean, again, I, I don't want to spend the whole rest of the evening, though I am tempted to do so. It's a fabulous thing. But, I mean, any other thoughts you have? What other ways do you see the gospel embedded in the Old Testament? Any other thoughts on that? I just, you know, I don't want to slow you down if you got this epiphany, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. The prophets. The prophets who foretold of a coming one who would conquer sin and death, who would do so even via his own blood as a substitutionary sacrifice, Isaiah 53, uh, Daniel 9. We'll talk about Daniel 9 here, you know, a few months when we get there. 
Um, but, I mean, wow, it's all over the Old Testament. If you're familiar with your Old Testament, it's all over the place. When you start seeing the gospel in the Old Testament, it's really profound. But his point is that they rejected God's promises and they, because of, of lack of faith. They didn't believe God. They didn't think God could be, you know, make good on his promises. So he's drawing a correlation. He says, so too can we fail to believe God. And his latest, greatest promise, which again, in the, you know, the author of Hebrews here, what's the latest, greatest promise? What did he say back in Hebrews chapter 1? You know, God's spoken to the fathers in times past by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. The latest, greatest promise that God has ever given is salvation through Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, we can't be faithless in that promise. Or, just like that wilderness generation of old, we will fail to enter into and enjoy God's rest. Does that make sense? So he's building a correlation there. Any thoughts on that? Questions on that? Someone? Hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I think, I mean, that gets us into another whole fascinating discussion, the nature of unbelief. What is, at its core, what is unbelief? And there's more than one answer to that, I think. But, you know, it could, be, as, as Simone just pointed out, it could be the simple persuasion that I am smarter than God. That, you know, you know that, I mean, really, it's arrogant to put it that way, but that's essentially what they're saying when God says, okay, you have a sin problem. I have decided to take care of that sin problem through the death of my son. You place your faith in that death and resurrection, and I'll forgive you of your sins. And people say, no, no, that just doesn't make sense to me. Or that's just, you know, it's too humiliating. I think... I can just work hard and I can pile up enough good works and I can get to heaven on my own. I'm smarter than God, right? I figured this out. So some that, I mean, that's one of the roots of unbelief is, is really an arrogance that thinks, well, I know better than God. Sometimes it's a timid fearfulness that you're like, well, I just don't know if God's actually strong enough or good enough that, you know, he might forgive so-and-so, but not me. Like, I, I'm just, I, I'm not, I'm not good enough for God. And so you doubt his goodness, or you doubt his grace, you doubt his power, you doubt his wisdom. You know, you can doubt any aspect of God, which is ultimately, you know, unbelief, but that's an interesting thought to camp on for a while, the nature of unbelief. Um, but yeah, whew. thanks for bringing that up. That stings a little bit. All right. <clears throat> any other thoughts there? Yeah, oh yeah, that's a big one. Is we like our sin so much we don't actually want to give it up. Yeah, that I don't think I need to be saved from it. I want to wallow in it. <laughs> that's that's true. That's a root of unbelief. Yeah, you got thought? Mm -hmm. 
right? Exactly. That's, that's it. That's true. Amen. And we got to take God on his terms because we, you know, we laugh at the people of the Old Testament. We're like, oh, they're so naive and, you know, they're idol worshipers and they're so quaint and, you know, ancient and we would never do that. But we do the same thing because really all we're doing is, you know, by exactly what you said, we want to add God to the equation, but the God of our own making. And if there's something about God that he, as he reveals himself in the script that I don't like, I just discard it. Well, that's an idol worshiper. You just made a God of your own liking. You know, you didn't take God as he reveals himself. You know, take it or leave it. You can't change God. He is who he is. You either believe that and receive that or resist that and create a God of your own making. And that's exactly, oh man, yeah, that happens all the time. And evangelicalism, you know, I mean, Christianity at large is guilty, guilty of that many, 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 many times in many ways is we don't like certain attributes or aspects about God, so we just say, boop, we just delete it out of the Bible. And, oh, man, don't get me started on this, but I get kind of fired up about it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well said. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, amen. Absolutely. Right. That's good. Amen. So, so think about this, because since we're on the topic, you know, <laughs> and we can't, why pass it up, right? But we're talking about the nature of unbelief, but let's, I mean, flip that for a second, because I want you to digest this, and this may be as far as we get tonight, that's okay. We'll just, you know, call it verses one to three. But, but he says here that the gospel did them no good because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. In other words, this, this is really important, But we're talking about the true nature of unbelief, but let's flip it on its head. What's the true nature of belief? What's the essence of faith? What is faith and what is it not? Because a lot of people, a lot of people, and a lot of Christians, it's really easy to misdefine faith. And as a result, we we get confused by it. We we don't communicate it very clearly um, and because it's muddled in our thinking. And, and I'm not saying we could just solve the world's problems in 10 minutes, but, but I think we should, we should be pretty intentional about trying to digest this because he says here the gospel does you no good unless it's mingled with faith. In other words, I, you know, I don't care if you got a seminary degree and you're the smartest person on, on the planet and you can talk about any portion of the Bible, but if, if, if your knowledge is not mixed with faith, it does you no good. And, and, you know, you're condemned eternally. So that's a pretty big deal. So, so what is the nature of faith then? What, how, you know, do you see where I'm going with this? How do we be sure that, you know, our, the gospel, we hear it, but it's mingled with faith. Yeah. Okay. So tra- faith, as Gordy just defined it, making a decision to trust. I like that. All right. Okay. Well, we can come back and develop that. You got another thought? Okay, so faith without works is dead. If, it's, if you're not living it out, it's not real faith. Exactly. That's an important distinction to make because faith is not, a lot of people, even theologians, if you're not careful, have reduced faith to a mental assent. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. He was a real person. You know, I believe he died. I believe he rose again. You know, and they mentally assent to a set of facts, but it never seems to change their life. Like there's zero evidence that that belief has actually 
you know, is bringing about behavior. So according to the Bible, that's not true belief. So, do you have another thought? John 3, says you've got to be born again. And then he says, again, he says, you can see the effect, you can't see it again. So, if you're born again, the Spirit comes in, and as it flows on your life, there will be an effect. Mm -hmm. Suffering from sin, right. loving the things that you didn't love before, hating the things that you did love before, there'll be a change. The That's good. That's good. And, and recall, we've built this case for the last couple of weeks as we've talked about the vital signs of a believer, right? Profession of faith in Christ, progression in the life, and perseverance. And if those things aren't in your life, there isn't real faith. Because real faith, as you both just pointed out, will always produce an effect. Do you, yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay, you both hand your hands up. Is this a competition or no? <laughs> Catherine, go ahead. Good, an absolute reliance outside of yourself. Good, that's a good definition for faith. An absolute reliance outside of yourself. Bob, what do you got to say? It's good. Excellent. Okay, because that's one of the, I would suggest, that's one of the outworkings of faith is asking for help or confession, calling upon the name of the Lord. You're not genuinely going to call out unless you realize you need help. Yep. It's good. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, someone. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. You guys should be teaching this, really. I mean, this is good. Ruby Mountain Bible Church, you know what faith is. This is good. Yeah. Good. Believing in his character and acting on that. Excellent. Good. All right, let me just summarize and condense this. I would suggest to you, and this is my go-to passage. There's lots of, and we're going to get all, all over the book of Hebrews. We're going to see this surface over and over again. We have lots of opportunities to temper, you know, and test our definitions and, and to, to see if they hold up to the test of Scripture. But I always like going to James 2. Go there just briefly, and we've got 10 minutes, then, we'll, then we'll, we'll wrap it up with this idea, all right? Go to James chapter 2. And I love James in his definition of faith because he gives us no real wiggle room. And it, it, he tells you what it is and he tells you what it's not. And I don't know about you, but sometimes the best way to define something, like if you are into articles of faith, if you are into mission statements and you read some of those you know, uh, articles from past historians or in church history, some of the most articulate statements, they will always give you a positive and a negative. This is what it is, but this is what it's not. This is what it is, this is what it's not. And it gets you, I mean, really fine-tunes your definition to make sure you know exactly what it's talking about. And James, too, is kind of like that when it comes to the nature of faith, the, the, the true nature of faith. And pick it up in verse 14, 14 to 26. He says, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can, and again, depending on your Bible translation, there's an article there in the Greek. It's best to say, can that faith save him? Or can, you know, and that's, and some translations bring that out. But he says, what does it profit, my brethren, though he, if a man says he has faith but has not works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give them uh, not those things that are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say... 
Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered, had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing thou hast uh, faith wrought, or seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was putted unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. All right, now this can be its own fascinating thorny passage. <laughs> um, but do you see the big ideas? As we just talked about, genuine faith will always bring a result. He says, the kind of faith, as he says in verse 14, that, ha that says, hey, I have faith, but it doesn't evidence, evidence itself in works. He says, that faith cannot save. That is not a saving kind of faith. He then gives us, I think, a fascinating, and this is my favorite in the Bible, example of non-faith. In verse 19, when he says, you believe there's one God? Good job. But the devils also believe and tremble. In other words, simple knowledge and mental assent is not biblical faith. Think about the demons. Do the demons know that there's one God? Yeah, they know that better than you and I do. They've seen him. They know that there's one God. They are, they're not denying that fact. They also tremble, which is fascinating because it, it shows a deep-seated emotional response. Are they afraid of God? Yes, they are. When Jesus shows up, remember? I love that scene, and he's casting out the demons, and the legion of demons says, whoa, what are you doing here? You know, you're here to torture us before our time. And remember that? I mean, they are freaked out at the power and the sovereignty of Jesus. Do demons believe there's a God? Yes. Do they tremble? Do they fear? Do they have an emotional response to that God? Yes. But neither of those is faith. Now, that's a pretty powerful idea because I know a lot of Christians or people that think they're Christians that, you know, that's, that's their understanding of faith as well. I, I believe there's a God. Okay, so are the demons. Well, I, I even respect God. Okay, so are the demons. They fear, they tremble. They're not, they don't have saving faith. So what is saving faith? And I think it involves knowledge. You need to know there is a God. Mental assent, belief. Okay, there is that God. But it's more than that. And I would suggest to you to, to kind of come back and circle back. Several of you made an illustration, you know, used words that, that are helpful here. When you said it's an absolute reliance outside of yourself. Or it's an absolute trust. Or, as Simone put it, and I, I you know, to, uh, and I, when you were saying your definition, my word is humility. To say, you know, that's to say, to have the humility to say, maybe God is smarter than me. Maybe there, you know, as, as you put it, quoting Isaiah 55, you know, that God's ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. Maybe God is smarter. Maybe I should just shut up and trust him. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, quit resisting. I'm just going to say, you know what? Maybe God. And so there's a, and I, I like to say, not that it's exclusively this, but I like to say that humility is a near synonym to faith. That you just trust that, you know what? Maybe I'm not the smartest, the fastest, the biggest, the strongest person out there. Maybe I am weak. Maybe I do need a savior, as, as you know, Catherine said, outside of myself. I can't do this. I am spiritually bankrupt. And that attitude, I, I, I think that is the core of biblical faith. 
And when I have that sort of humility, admission of my own small, finite puniness, sinfulness, and I just say, you know what? Wow, I am a wreck. Without God, without intervention, it's a disaster. And so I, as Gordy said, trust. As Catherine said, you know, there, outside of myself, I need to rely on somebody else. I need a savior. And that sort of humility that admits, and then faith, which is kind of, again, they're near synonyms, but faith is kind of the positive where you say, okay, humility and repentance is the, the negative side. I can't do this. I am nothing. But then faith is the positive side. Jesus did do this. He is something. He is strong. I am not. I can't do it, but he can. And there's a difference between just a belief and, as you both put it, a reliance or a trust where I am committing myself to that. And the illustration, I've used this before, um, but, you know, I, I kind of use the, the dad, you know, and the son in the tree. Remember this illustration? Have I said this way too many times? Is it totally boring? Okay, here it is again. But I, you know, when I was a kid, I, 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 liked, I liked to climb things, just like any kid. I was a young boy. But you climb up a tree, and just like the cat that gets stuck in the tree, you climb up, but you can't get down. So I call for dad. Dad's the solution to all problems, right? So you call for dad, and he comes under the tree, and he says, jump, I'll catch you. Now, if I really believe my dad is both able that he's actually strong enough and he can catch me, and he's willing that he's not just a trickster that will say, jump, and then step out of the way, and then wham, you know, like, okay, I believe in his ability. I believe in his goodness, his willingness, that he's not out to get me. He loves me. He wants to catch me. If I genuinely believe that, what will I do? I will jump. If I say I believe him, but refuse to jump, and I say, go get a ladder, do I really believe him? No. I might say I believe him, but I don't believe him. Why? Because my belief, genuine belief, will show up in my behavior, my action. If I believe him, I will jump, and I will trust myself to his care, and he'll catch me. Does that make sense? So, I mean, that is an illustration of, you know, the... I got... I got one minute. Let me give you another illustration. My dad used to say this one all the time when I was a kid. And I think, you know, it's actually based upon a true story. And I forget the guy's name. But it was this tightrope walker that was famous for walking the tightrope. And so he decided to stretch a tightrope across Niagara Falls and walk the tightrope. And he did this. You know, and the crowds gather and he walks the tightrope and he comes back. And he rock, walks the tightrope and comes back. And you watch him do it a couple of times. And then he says, hey, do you believe I can do this? And you're like, well, yeah, I just saw you do it. Right. And he's like, okay. And then he turns to you and he says, well, can I have that baby in your arms? And I'll be right back. <laughs> and you, yeah, exactly. And you're like, whoa, now, you know, but see, there's a difference between saying, I believe you and being trusting where you say, okay, my belief is going to result now in trust. I am going to give over to you my eternity, my security, my safety. I'm going to give it up because God is in control and he is able and he is willing to save. Does that make sense? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a powerful illustration, but it's, you know, but the point is it's trying to help you see the difference between saying you believe something and actually trusting and committing yourself to that thing you say you believe in. You got a thought? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, because even the devils, you know, believing in trembling, 
that it's okay. Like an emotional response is a part of genuine faith. It's not, you know, just uh, emotional response by itself is not genuine faith. But genuine faith will have a, an em- after the foundation is laid. Good job. Wait a yeah. But you're right. It will result in a genuine, you know, emo- emotional response, a loyalty to that thing, to that object. Exactly. Yep. That's good. That's excellent. And and that's a good point. Think about try to live out Rahab's life. Oh, me too. <laughs> And when you think about it, I mean, she was essentially, I mean, if you understand the dynamics at play there, if Rahab was caught helping these enemy spies and those enemy spies and their army did not turn out to be victorious, what would have happened to Rahab? She's executed. You know, I mean, she was a traitor. So she would have been executed. See, so she was, I mean, hopefully that just helps you see the stakes were high. You know, for her to say, yes, I'm going to trust in this God. I'm going to trust in this people group that, you know, I am not a part of. I'm an outsider, but I'm going to trust in them. And I'm going to gamble my life on this. That's how much I trust. And that's, you know, it's it's an outflow of her genuine faith. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because that and that's another whole thing. But think about how much revelation she had up to that point. She'd only heard about the Exodus, but only heard about the Exodus. I mean, that's a big deal. But <laughs> but still, you're right. He didn't didn't have a whole Bible. Well, that's a profound thought. Well, I'm pretty satisfied. You guys know what faith is. Well done. All right. Telling you, like I said, you guys could have been up here teaching it. So, but I'm glad we paused on that. And so next uh, next time uh, we will, because I am again, I'm gone next Wednesday. We are having next Wednesday. Bob is filling in for me. All right, so everybody come and enjoy what Bob or the Lord is going to uh, speak through Bob. But uh, then after that, when I come back the week after that, then we will we'll jump back into Pro- or Hebrews chapter four and uh, pick it up right there in verse you know, three and four, that transition, and we'll keep going. But let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time this evening. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the faithfulness of your promises. Thank you, Lord, for the steadfast character that you have. Lord, as was mentioned this evening, as Gloria mentioned, Lord, the the character of our God, that you are able, you are willing, you are ready to save. You have demonstrated that willingness and that ability. And we ask that you would help us to have faith in that that we would commit ourselves with absolute trust in a a being and a power outside of ourselves, that we would have the humility to admit our own weaknesses and inability and ignorance, and that we would cast ourselves upon your grace. And Lord, that genuine sort of faith transforms lives. It, it, It brings about a difference in behavior, in action, in thought, in deed. God help us. Help us to stoke that sort of faith in our lives, in our hearts, that we would not be guilty of what that wilderness generation was guilty of, to hear the truth and yet to not have it mingled with faith. Gracious Father, help us. Help us to mingle your word with faith that we might trust in it, rely upon it, and live it out for your glory. So we commit ourselves to you afresh here this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen.